Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. And this afternoon, friends, we're going to tackle a subject that, uh, well, not going actually directly into the subject of the Revelation uh, 12 sign in the sky there, but more going about the idea of the uh, Yom Kippur and the possibility of this being the year of Jubilee. Actually, because of an email that I'd received from uh, Sister Heidi Bagley and even Brother Paul Bagley had wrote as well, uh, was asking me a question about the last trumpet, the shofar that, we, that, that is actually blown on the year of Jubilee. Uh, and that actually falls on the Day of Atonement, as we call it in Hebrew, Yom Kippur. Uh, did I know anything about whether or not this is considered the last trump based on Jewish belief? Well, I wasn't quite sure about that myself, but it did cause me to do a little bit of digging. And as a result, in fact, an incredible revelation that the Holy Spirit revealed to me about the events that will transpire when, in fact, it is the year of Jubilee. And, of course, that could be this year. I don't know, though. I have to tell you straight up, I don't know if this is the year of Jubilee or not. I do know that last year, when there was a lot of hype about 2016 being the year of Jubilee, I shared with my wife then, I didn't think that that was the year. I said, if anything, I would think it would be in 2017. Just as an educated guess, not meaning that 2017 is the year of Jubilee. But there is a lot of excitement because of the planetary alignment that is happening now. Uh, we have Virgo and uh, Leo coming together, the sun and the moon, uh, along with a whole list of planets that line up, uh, that some are believing this is actually going to be a fulfillment of prophecy of Revelation chapter 12, where it speaks about the woman with the sun and the moon, uh, the, the, the sun at her head and the moon at her feet, etc. Uh, the 12 stars. I can't say myself whether or not. I know that the alignment is definitely coming. It's supposed to be over Jerusalem. I realize all of these things here, and no doubt maybe there is something definitely biblically significant about it, uh, but as a result, it's also brought out uh, news articles like the one here on the screen here, End of the World, the Rapture is Coming on September 23rd, claims Christian evangelist, and I don't know if people actually are really implying that it's absolutely going to be on that date, and I hope not, because if it comes and goes, and if nothing does happen, then, well, it kind of hits us uh, pretty hard once again. We have to recover from setting dates once again. So, uh, But I think a lot of people are looking at it as being a possible sign, and yes, maybe something could happen. I know there's many people are hopeful of a rapture, uh, taken from verse, I uh, believe that's 1 Corinthians. We'll, we'll get into that in just a few minutes here. Uh, but when it comes to the trumpet, though, that's what really caught my attention and the fact, could it be the year of Jubilee? Now, there is a rabbi from the 12th century, Rabbi uh, Yudah ben Samuel, that actually did make some very incredible prophecies. Uh, WND exclusive that wrote about a little while back, 12th century rabbi predicted Israel's future. Uh, says here, Yudah ben Samuel was a legendary, prolific German rabbi of the 12th century who made some astonishing and specific predictions about the future of Jerusalem and Israel that came true. And I'm going to share those with you in just a moment. But as I said, too, uh, it was last year, Jonathan Kahn, who had shared uh, quite extensively that it was the year of Jubilee. And who's to say it was or was not? But there are some very interesting insights that I'm going to share with you tonight that when the year of Jubilee does fall and it does cause the trumpet to be blown on the Day of Atonement, I believe there's some incredible scriptures that prove what will really happen that day. So I actually kind of think that perhaps that year of Jubilee has never sounded as of yet. Uh, but anyway, Rabbi uh, Samuel, he actually says here, published, uh, pu or published the results of his biblical calculations, the uh, gematria, and astrology observations, and summarized as follows, when the Ottomans, who were already a power to be reckoned with on the Bosphorus in the time of Judah ben Samuel, uh, conquer Jerusalem, they will rule over Jerusalem for eight jubilees. Afterwards, Jerusalem will be a no man's land, he, he said, for one jubilee. And then in the ninth jubilee, it will once again come back into the possession of the Jewish nation, which would significant, uh, signify the beginning of the messianic end time. Now, oddly enough, 
it happened exactly that way. The Ottoman Turks, when they took uh, the, the Jerusalem, they did reign over it exactly eight jubilees, 400 years. And of course, Jerusalem itself was considered a no man's land. There was actually a sign in Jerusalem because of the separation there after Israel became a nation in 1948. And because they did not take Jerusalem back, uh, it was considered a no man's land. In other words, no one really had full control over that particular uh, por portion of land. And exactly 50 years went by uh, from the time of the fall of Jerusalem from the Ottoman Empire in 1917 until 1967 uh, when, when the Israeli army took Jerusalem in the Six Days War and that ended that jubilee there exactly as Rabbi uh, ben, uh, Yudah ben Samuel actually predicted. Again though, now he was doing his based on uh, some astrology alignment, stuff like that. So I can't say that it's 100% accurate as far as is that really the Jubilee, but that's the way he termed it, a Jubilee year. So the question comes up as 2017 being the end of yet another Jubilee, if in fact this were to be the Jubilee year. Now, Sister Heidi, when she had sent me the message, she had asked me the question, if I would look at this, could I see whether or not, uh, in fact, was, uh, you know, let me just read part of what it says. There's Jews are to delay the Rosh Hashanah celebration for 10 days, which falls on Yom Kippur. They are to celebrate both Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur on the same day, and the trumpets that are to be blown are known as the last trump due to the fact that there is no other trumps that are supposed to be sounding according to the book of Leviticus. Now, maybe some rabbis actually refer to it that way. I'm not really sure on that particular issue, but is it the last trumpet of, the, of that particular season? Yes. Uh, Levitical law, according to Leviticus chapter 25, yes, there was to be a trumpet blown on Yom Kippur, which is kind of interesting because at no other time did we have a trumpet blowing uh, during Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a very solemn celebration. It is, a, it is a time of mourning, so I don't really call it a celebration. It's a time of reflection, a time of afflicting your soul. Uh, in fact, it is the one time in uh, Jerusalem you will not see cars move. Uh, unless it were to be a military or police vehicle, everything comes to a dead steal as we mourn and we're supposed to fast during that time. Uh, let me just read to you Leviticus chapter 23 here, verses 26 to 28, just to kind of give you a little bit of insight on this. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Howbeit on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. There shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls, and you shall bring an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now, actually, it's kind of interesting. It doesn't literally say an offering made by fire, but you are to bring near the fire to the Lord. I've always wondered if that's not speaking about bringing the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the high the the uh, Aisha, because it's in the feminine here, it's not just the word Aish here, but in the feminine, it always seems like it's more like bringing near the Holy Spirit unto the Lord. Uh, and you shall do no manner of work in that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. All right. Now, Many times I've taught on this before, and I've likened this to Zechariah's prophecy right here, chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. Of course, at verse 9, speaking, it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Uh, and so we know that it's a time where there's so many people against uh, the Jewish nation. I will pour upon, and by the way, it's not, let me kind of back up and clarify something here. And it shall come to pass that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, not against Israel. That's something that a lot of people kind of overlook. And I've even overlooked it as well. So I can't say that I haven't. I haven't really thought about this uh, and really meditated about this as much as I should have. This is not a, an attack on the Jewish people per se, but it's an attack on Jerusalem. Everybody, as the Bible says, uh, Jerusalem becomes a burdensome stone. Now, who is the ones that are all trying to come to take Jerusalem? Well, you've got the Vatican that wants Jerusalem. You've got the Palestinians that want Jerusalem. You have the Jordanians that want Jerusalem. And of course, the Jewish people as well want Jerusalem. Uh, there's so much interest in Jerusalem, and they have all come against it. 
And the, the God of Israel says he's going to destroy all those nations that come against it. All right. So, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace of supplication, and they shall look upon me because they have thrust him through. I think we have in the King James pierce, look upon him whom they have pierced is what we have, but it literally is thrust through. Uh, it is not the word in Hebrew right here uh, that you have here. That is not the word for pierce. But I always look at the time when he was thrust through with his side with the spear by the Roman soldier. Uh, of course, that is put to the charge of the Jewish people regardless, because why complicity handing over Yeshua to the Roman authorities to be crucified instead of them doing the work themselves, because it said that it was not lawful for them to put a man to death, so they handed him to the Romans to do the dirty work. So nonetheless, yes, it would still put our, our people uh, responsible for his death as a result there. But anyway, it says, They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day, there, there, uh, there, excuse me, shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, and the mourning of uh, Hadrimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart. Now notice it's a mourning, just like what the holiday Yom Kippur is all about. It is a day of mourning, a day of reflection, of afflicting our souls to recognize what did we do wrong? Where is our sin? Well, our sin is right here in Zechariah. Now notice also, all right, the, uh, as the land is mourning there, and, there, and they, every family is apart. The family of the house of David apart, their wives apart. The family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart. The family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart. All right, it goes all the way down. The family of Shemai is apart, their wives are apart. All the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. And there's a couple of things here, very important for you to notice here. One, the fact that there's a separation of husband and wife. Now, in Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox communities, that's exactly what happens. You see it in the synagogues. The men sit on one side, the women sit on another side. Even at a funeral, when they're doing a funeral, the men are on one side, the women are on another side. So the funeral is that way. You have it in the, in the, in the services. There are some occasions during a funeral, possession, etc., where they're not separate, but all you have to do is just go online. You can see even the pictures of the men go follow the casket, etc. cetera. Uh, but, but in secular, non-Orthodox communities, they're not apart. They do actually come together. But it's interesting, though, because it's very much a biblical custom. But I also noticed, too, if you notice the, all the family names that are mentioned here, another interesting aspect of this, David apart, and of course, who is it with David? Nathan. Both these men here are from the house of, excuse me, from the tribe of Judah. Uh, you have Levi. Of course, the Levites are from the Levite family. You have the family of the Shemite, uh, Shem, uh, Shemites there, who are the Benjamites. They are the tribe of Benjamin. Now, I do want to come back to Levi because one thing, as I was sharing with you the other day, I don't believe that every Orthodox Jew in Israel is actually truly a Levite. I do believe that there is a a, also a descendant of the Maccabee brothers that are in there because they overtook the priesthood. But remember, we do have an example that some of them definitely could truly be Levites as well, because why? John the Baptist, his father was a temple, worked in the temple as a priest as well. He did not leave that post of duty when the rest of the Orthodox community ended up going down to the, uh, to the Qumran community there. Uh, down at Qumran, the, as they were called them, the Essenes. Those were supposedly the true Levitical priests down there. But again, some of the Levitical priests remained, and no doubt today we have, as the Bible would say, some of the Levites that are back. But again, I don't think that all of them are. Uh, Shimei is another interesting case here, because why Shimei? Beautiful story in the story of David, when David, after he does like Yeshua does, weeps over Jerusalem, after Absalom does not recognize his father to be the king and overthrows his father, David not willing to put down the rebellion, just like it was in the case when Jesus was here and Peter took his sword out, cut the, cut the, 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 the guy's ear off there, and Jesus says, let him know, you know, could I not summon a, a, a legion of angels and, and my father would deliver him right now, all right? And what does he do? Just like David 
that he wouldn't battle. But David, as he goes over the hill, who meets him? A guy named Shimei. Uh, and what was he? A Benjamite, just like in this case here. And he's spitting on David, throwing stones at him and his men and, and cursing him for everything because of he was a, a descendant of Saul. And But when David, after he crosses the river, when he's coming back into power, when when Absalom has died, just as a type of the Jews that rejected Yeshua 2,000 years ago, that generation has died off, all right? And now they're coming back. And of course, don't forget, what did David do? He left 10 concubines behind and said, care for my house in my absence. And of course, the Jews, you know, Absalom abused those wives. And that is a type of the believers today, the Christians today. Uh, even could be a type, uh, 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 well, we won't go into that, but anyway, beautiful type of the believers today that even though they may be abused by many of the Orthodox community, we are to care for them, all right? That's a command of God, I do believe, in a, in a type there for us. But who was it that met David at the river on the way back when David's coming into power? It was Shimei. And he, what was he doing? Weeping and mourning for how he had rejected David as being the anointed of God. So we see the same case here as a reminder of who was the one that rejected him, the Benjamites there. All right, now, so that kind of sets the stage. We know then that Yom Kippur is the day, the Feast of Mourning, but because of this beautiful letter, and, there, and Sister Cheryl, won't call her last name, she was one of the ones that had wrote this to Sister uh, Begley, and she'd also wrote me as well about this, wonderful insight that they have there, you know, wondering, could this be a sign of the last Trump? Because there's so much excitement about, uh, what. Well, in fact, September 23rd, that's the day that the alignment happens. Yom Kippur actually begins on the eve of September 29th, according to the Gregorian calendar going on over to September 30th, which is Friday and Saturday uh, that this happens on, which is kind of interesting that it's actually falling on the Sabbath as well. All right, but let's take a look at this though. Here's where this comes in about that blowing of the shofar. And then I've got to share with you the incredible revelation that goes with this. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of the years unto thee. This is Leviticus chapter 25, by the way, verses 8 to 10. Seven times seven years, and there shall be unto thee the days of the seven Sabbaths of the years, even forty and nine years. Then shalt thou make a proclamation with the blast of the horn. And some people think that that's done with, a, uh, with, with the, with the uh, metal horn. That's not true. It's actually done with the shofar. Uh, in the Hebrew language, it is the shofar on the tenth day of the seventh month the Day of Atonement. Now, some ask, you know, they have to prolong Rosh Hashanah, the, 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 the first day of the year. The true Rosh Hashanah is not this time of year, friends. We celebrate it that way, but it's really not the first of the year. The first of the year is during the time near Passover, Nisan 1. That is the true Rosh Hashanah, all right? But it's been totally done different. So you make a proclamation with the horn throughout all your land. Now, watch what he says here. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. Keep that in mind, all right? It's not going to end there. Let's go a little bit further. A jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You shall not uh, sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of the undressed vines. For it is a jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. All right. Now, this may seem simple, the way we look at it. But I have wondered for years about one passage in Isaiah 61 that when I got this email from Sister Heidi asking about it, and then I got curious, and then I went to begin to go and look, and, and I began to, I was actually reading right here is where I was reading at. When I was reading here in Leviticus chapter 25, and I got to the part about, you know, that, that, that you were not to, you, you know, you, you shall not sow, neither reap that which you groweth of itself, in it, nor gather the grapes in it, or undress the vines. And when I was reading that, 
the Holy Spirit just moved upon my heart and revealed to me, this is the answer to Isaiah 61, Yeshayahu 61. Now, I've got to share it with you because I'm excited about it. And I'm just trusting God will show you exactly what I'm talking about here. I know it'll be a blessing. Let's get started with it here. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath what? Anointed me. This is, remember, Yeshua read this inside the synagogue in Israel, right? He was reading this book. The priest brought him the book. He opened the scroll and he read from Isaiah 61. And it said, He hath anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the eyes to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's good pleasure. And he closed the book, rolled the scroll back up, and he handed it back to the priest, and he said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in the hearing of your ears. Why didn't he read the rest of verse 2? Remember how many people love to say that? You know, well, you didn't read it all the way down the rest of the way. You know, you're taking it out of context. Well, I guess they'd say the same about Yeshua. You're taking it out of context. You forgot to read the rest of verse 2. No, it's not the way it works, friends. Because sometimes it don't always apply. And in fact, verse 2 doesn't apply for another 2,000 years. All right? But let's look at it. And we're going to go into Matthew 2. You're going to find out it all ties together. All right? Why? And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that what? Mourn. What do you know? A mourning time. A Yom Kippur. A day of atonement. Yom, day, Kippur, atonement. A day of mourning, you might translate that as well, right? Of the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all them that mourn. When, when is Israel supposed to mourn? On the day of atonement. All right? Now, to appoint unto them that mourn, where? In Zion. To give unto them a garland uh, for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the terebinths of righteousness of the what? The planting of the Lord wherein he might glory. Now see, what are you not supposed to do? On the year of Jubilee, you're not to plant. And you're not to reap from that vine. You're not to harvest from that vine. Why? Because the Lord is the one that did the planting. He did the planting. Watch what else happens here. Moving on down, right? And they shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations and they shall renew the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. You know what that's speaking of? You are the city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. Is that not what the scripture says? Right? What is the desolations? Remember I shared with you recently from Daniel when he talks about that abomination. I was, the Lord was dealing with me about the abomination that maketh desolate. And then we find out that it's the popes of Rome and what have they done down through the last what, 1,800 years or 1,700 years since the beginning of the Catholic Church and all the crusades they've done and everything else, murdering and killing off and killing off. Nothing but desolation. And no wonder why Yeshua says, they say, peace, peace, and there is no peace. Because why? That Antichrist spirit, he is the abomination that makes desolate. But... In this case here, and they, that's a plural right there, ubanu, see, see, and they shall build the old waste, they shall raise up the former desolations. Now, there's a lot of ways we could look at that, because I know there's a lot of people expecting a, a rapture to happen on September 23rd. I, again, I can't say, friends, I cannot say, but that's kind of interesting here. They shall raise up the former desolation. Is there going to be a resurrection when the two witnesses come? I don't know. I have no idea. All right? I'm just reading. Uh, again, on this here, it's conjecture. All right? I can't say for sure. I'm just sharing some insights is all I'm doing on this. So please don't get that wrong. And they shall renew the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. All right? Now, 
It's the sons of the Nacher, not really an alien, all right? But he, they become what? Your plowmen and your vine dressers. This is why on the command of the Jubilee year, on the Day of Atonement, you're not to be doing any of the reaping. Because God has commanded what? His two witnesses to come during that time because Yeshua did the planting, okay? And then they come in as the vine dressers. But you shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations and their splendor shall you revel. For your shame, which was double, and for that they rejoice, confusion is their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. Now, let me share a little bit more with you here from Matthew's gospel. This is what I find so beautiful here. It goes right back, because remember, that planting, see, remember, you weren't to plant that year. And we find out that Yeshua, he's the one that does the planting according to Isaiah, the planting of the Lord, right? He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. All right? The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. And the word angel is a messenger. There's your two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, right there, coming to do what? To reap the harvest. Exactly what Isaiah shows here, that they're the, the plowmen are the vine dressers. I never could understand. what I knew that this in, in Isaiah 61 represented, those strangers represented uh, uh, the two witnesses. I've always known that because it's the redemption of Israel. And there's more than one of them. I've known that. I realized that that would happen. But the thing that I couldn't understand is why do you call them vine dressers? It has everything to do with the Jubilee year. Because you're the vine itself, your grapevine, you're not to harvest. Why? Because Jesus gave that command in Matthew, because of the tares, let them grow together until the harvest. So your two witnesses have to be the one that do the gathering there because that's the only safe way to get it. And so this is what we find out. This is what happens. Yeshua, let me back up again here to Isaiah. Oh, too far. Isaiah 61 here. All right. Let me see if I get the right part here. They shall raise up the former desolations. Okay, wait a minute. Well, that's back further, I guess. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give to them the garland of ashes, the joy of mourning, the mantle of praise, for the spirit of heaviness, they might be called the terabas of righteousness. What? The planting of the Lord. See? The planting of the Lord, wherein he might glory. And Yeshua said in Matthew that he, the Son of Man, plants the seed. And you're commanded on the year of Jubilee not to plant that year. So when we get to that last jubilee and we get that last, and I don't know if that's considered the last trumpet, okay? That's, I understand the, the, what the sisters were saying, and that may be so. I have no idea. Because it does say at the last trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, right? I mean, we do know that. We have this over uh, one of Paul's writings there in 1 Corinthians, I believe is where that's at. Now, and what's interesting, as I stated to you already, though, could it be because also they shall raise up the former desolations? And what is it that the Antichrist has always been a desolator of? It's the believers trying to kill off the remnant of Israel. This is why the devil was wroth with the woman. And went after what? This is in Revelation there. If you want to jump back to look at that, Revelation 12. He went after the remnant of the woman's seed. That is all 12 tribes of Israel. And let me tell you something, my Christian brothers and sisters. There's many of you that have a love for Israel that have no idea that you're part of that lost 10 tribes. And what is it? It's not so much that we're returning to the land in Israel per se on that very ground there, but we recognize who we are and that's what will bind the two sticks together. The stick of Ephraim or the stick of Joseph that's in the hand of Ephraim and the stick of Judah. That's what will bind them together. 
recognize who you are and it will bind us together. Unreal. Some of these incredible prophecies. And don't forget, as we brought out Revelation chapter 11, Isaiah 61, those strangers, those vine dressers are truly your two witnesses and I will give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees. These are the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth, devour their enemies. I don't believe that's a literal fire. I believe it's when whatever they speak will happen like Elijah. He called the fire, Elisha called the fire down and it devoured the men, right? These have power to shut heaven that it rained not in the days of their prophecy. That's exactly what Elijah did. Turn the waters to blood. It's what Moses did. So again, we see the ministries repeated all over again. We are, friends, we are definitely coming up on the last days. Is it this year? I don't know. I really don't know, but I do find fascinating to see that one thing's for sure, your two witnesses will have a major part in what happens in that 50th Jubilee. And they're saying, as they brought out in the news, it's when tribulation begins, Jacob's trouble starts. Well, it's definitely when they come, there's a lot of trouble starts, no doubt about it. Is it this year or not? I don't know. I really don't know, friends. I don't want to say that and then some, nothing happened and everybody wonder what in the world was just all a big joke or something. No, I don't know. I just don't know. But I know that God is a wonderful God. And if you don't know Yeshua as your own Savior, let me encourage you to seek Him and, and stay there in prayer until you know that He has saved your soul. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for standing with us here in this ministry here. There's not many people that are willing to do it. And your support in what we do is what helps us to, to, to spend the time in study and in prayer and seeking out these truths of God and to share them with you. And I ask you to share this with your friends everywhere you possibly can. If it's a blessing to you and you'd like to support this work, you can do so. Just go to our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org or israelreturns.com uh, and right here on our own channel, Israeli News Live. Make sure you're on Israeli News Live and right above the subscribe button, there's a little donation place. You can do that as well. We thank you and we thank you for all your love, your support, your prayers. We covet tremendously. And again, any way you can possibly share these messages, we feel like it's a blessing to people that are trying to get the word out. Please do so. Shalom.